He must have known the people who were going to talk to him. He stopped his car. He had some groceries, some fish from the fish market in his, on the passenger seat. And they opened up on him and shot him a whole bunch of times and killed him. Hey guys, I got a story today that is phenomenal. I was talking about a guy, Jimmy Rotunda, who uh, became the underboss of the DeCavacanti family. When I was starting to talk about him and his story, Peanuts asked me questions like, who, who was he and how did you know him? And it really woke me up to my first meeting with him and why it happened. So this is going to be a long, complicated story. You have to follow this closely. There's a lot of twists and turns in it. So how does this story start? Where do I start it? Jimmy Rotonda became the underboss of the DeCavacanti family. One day when he was going home, he stopped his car. He had a Lincoln that he used to drive. I knew him very well, and, and you'll see why and how. He must have known the people who were going to talk to him. He stopped his car. He had some groceries, some fish from the fish market in his, on the passenger seat. And they opened up on him and shot him a whole bunch of times and killed him. He was an underboss. Me and John Gotti went to the funeral. John Riggi was the boss of the, the Cavacanti family at that time, was at the funeral. He took me and John on the side. And he told us that he was super concerned. If they could take out the underboss, I'm probably next. Really shooken up by this. A lot of people at the funeral. We talked to him on the side. John said, listen, don't worry about it. We got your back. The DeCavacanti family don't have a commission seat. The five New York families have a seat. Each one of them have a seat. That's the commission. So we were going to represent him. John was going to represent him at the commission, investigate this hit. And he felt really comfortable with that. He already knew how close I was with Jimmy Rotunda because of a lot of things, and you'll see. We left the funeral, and uh, I understand that John had a commission meeting. I wasn't there, but he had told the commission, asked them, who did this? Nobody seemed to know. It was obviously a sneak hit. Could have been internal. We didn't know what it was. Nobody knew what it was. But we were on guard to f try to find out who did this. So I'm going to go back to when I met him and why and how. Me, my Goombada, Ali boy, and Louis Melito, I'm not going to get too in-depth with this because you heard this story. We're indicted with a guy named Larry Martiri. None of us including Larry Martiri, supposedly at that time, said he knew anything about it. But later we found out, when we were out on bail, we were about to fight the case. It took a long time. That he knew everything about it. The witness, a guy named Michael Hardy, is the guy who talked about this whole case, how we all got indicted, all four of us. A refresh your recollection with Michael Hardy. He's the guy who would give, he knew Louis Melito very well, he would give us stick-ups. The story, the hostage gone bad where the girl jumped on my chest and we went in and took this group. 
Michael Hardy gave us that robbery. And, uh, and many, many more. And me and Ali Boy would commit them. So Michael Hardy's story was that he was in a pizzeria in Coney Island. And the case was that he sat down with Mimi Scala, a captain, a very dangerous captain in the Colombo family. And these Dunn brothers owed Mimi money. And they didn't pay him, some bullshit story like that. Supposedly, this is Michael Hardy's story, that Louis Molino came into that meeting was called in by Mimi. Mimi said he was going to pay him money to have the Dunn brothers killed. But not both of them, one. And he gave his name. Michael Hardy tells Mimi that Louis got a couple of guys around him, good friends of his, that are shooters. Sammy the Boat and Alley Boy Como. This is on our indictment. Now, none of us knew what was going on. It was really hard to fight the case. I did a think of a video about this too. We went, I wound up beating it. Then we come to find out why did he do this? Why did Michael Hardy do this? Michael Hardy is in prison on other charges. Some guy was banging his wife. He was on the lam. He comes back in, knocks on the guy's door, and shoots him four or five times and kills him. He goes after this guy with Larry Martiri, one of Larry Martiri's best friends, right-hand man. He snatches him. He brings him in an apartment, Ties him in a bathtub to the stop to the shower, tied up like this. Turns the hot water on full blast. He wants information from him. He's beating him with a gun. And he's being cooked with this hot water. The guy is screaming, moaning, crying. He says, I'm going to give you one more chance. It's a long barrel gun. He sticks the barrel up his ass, all the way up. The guy literally is fainting. He's passing out. He yanks the gun out and all his intestines or whatever it is, just rips him apart. Leaves him in there, so badly beaten, burnt, bleeding from the rectum. He leaves him for dead. The guy don't die. He survives. Goes to the hospital. God knows how long he's in the hospital. But he tells Larry Martiri. Larry Martiri gets in touch with him. He's always had a connection with him. And uh, tells him that he has a big score, that he needs him. And he makes an appointment to meet him somewhere. Michael Hardy comes into that meeting. He's arrested by a slew of detectives with guns out. He's, he got sucked into a meeting. And Larry Martiri has actually set him up, threatening him. And the guy who got tortured is going to testify against him. Michael Hardy calls me from a prison and tells me, I need your help. I know prison phones are monitored. I'm not stupid. So I said, how could I help you? And he says, I need you to kill Larry Martiri and go after the kid's name, the guy's, the other guy's name, who he told you. I said, listen, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. I don't do stupid shit like that. Oh, you must be playing, right? You're joking with me. I want to talk into that microphone. 
I'm on a show. I have nothing to do with nothing. I don't even know what he's talking about. I know it's being taped, so I'm not going to just hang up on him. So I'm saying, listen, I would help you, but I don't even know what you're talking about. And I don't do things like that, bro. I don't know why you would say that to me. He's talking a little bit more. I talked a little bit more. And then I said, hello, hello, hello. And I hang up. So they could keep that tape and stick it up in their ass. Whoever's listening on the other end. But I call Louis Melito and Alley Boy. And I tell both of them. This guy lost his mind, bro. This is what he told me on the phone, in the prison, on the fucking tape. Don't answer the phone if he calls. Now, we were, we were doing robberies with him. Don't do it. Something's radically wrong for him to talk like that. Make your wife answer the phone, both of them, I'm telling. And if it's him, all she's got to do is say, listen, he's not home, and hang up on him. Unbeknownst to me, one of our phones is bugged. We didn't say nothing wrong. I didn't say nothing wrong. So nobody's going to get pinched. Nobody's going to get hurt. But here's what the cops do. They take that tape. They bring it to him. And they show him the tape. Oh, this fucking Sammy. I called him up for help. And look, he's double-crossing me. So he's mad at me, Louie, and Alley Boy. So he makes up this fictitious story to get out of prison now. He cooperates with the government. It's not the government, it's the state. It was a state case. And tells them this fictitious story. It took a long time to find this all out. About this meeting and about the dumb brothers. Now he also puts Mimi in it. Mimi's this powerful, vicious captain in the Colombo family. So when I told this story, I never told you about Mimi, but I'm telling you about him now. He's on my indictment. So four of us are on this indictment. Not just me, Ali Boy, and Louie were in jail, but Mimi wasn't in jail. God knows where he was. In prison, me, Louie, and Ali Boy talked. Every time Mimi gets arrested and he's got a case, before he goes to trial, his co-defenders just seem to disappear. He gets rid of them. He has a better tr chance at a case. He kills them. They're not just going on the lamb. They're gone. He's got a habit of doing that. We knew that. We talked about it. What are we going to do, bro? Not only we don't know about this case, but this fucking guy... We can't just sit around, bro. We're going to disappear. So we agreed in prison as soon as we get out, we're going to make him disappear. We're going to reverse this. We're not going to wait to be killed because he don't trust us. Fuck him. We're going to kill him. We make a pack amongst the three of us, and we're going to kill him. Unbeknownst to us, because of his viciousness, and killing people on the record, off the record, the Colombo family had already killed him before the indictment, and he was missing. So his days of making people missing, he became missing, unbeknownst to us at that point. We were concerned when we got out, where is he? What is he thinking? We got a nudge. He ain't thinking nothing, bro. He's missing. He ain't coming back. Bu music to our ears. Now all we had to do was fight a state case that we had no fucking clue what went on. We had 52 court appearances. They seg separated the trials. Larry Monteri went on trial alone, and then they were going to tr have a trial with me, Ali Boy, and Louis Melito. Two separate trials. Larry beat the case. Had money, high-ass lawyers. He beat the case. We were on there, and uh, we beat the case. But we knew all the details like I'm telling you now. Back then, I knew it 
like I know it right now. Case over. My Gumbada Ali boy was with the Genovese people. He was with this guy, Joey Mann, was a made guy. My Gumbada wasn't made. And Joey Mann's captain, I forgot his name. This is in 73, 74, someplace. I forgot his name. They took him down. He was replaced with a guy named Tommy Lombardo, who took, became the captain. When he died, Sally Dogs became the captain. But that's all not that important. What is important is the case is over. We celebrate. Alley Boy's got to go to his people. Me and Louis Molito are in the Gambino family. We're going to go to Tato. Tato's super happy we beat this case. I mean, he did everything to help us. He was sick that we were on this fucking trial. And he knew and believed every minute of it that we didn't know what the fuck was going on. There was no reason for us to hide from him. We did work. There was no reason to hide. And he was super happy. So me and Louie met with him and we said, listen, case over. Everybody's happy. We tell him the whole entire story. We told it to him in stages. He knew it in different pieces. We want to kill Larry Martiri. He may believe he didn't know what was going on. He set the guy up with his guy. We know all the whole story. If he would have, and he never told us, he would have never told, if we would have found, been found guilty, we would have done life without parole, went to state, and never even know, knew why. We want to kill him. Who's he with? He's with the DeCavacanti family. He's with this guy, his name is Danny Nunziata. Him and this guy, Corky. Remember Corky? I did a thing about him a while ago. Corky. Wasn't a bay guy at that point, but he was a very powerful guy. He was Danny Nunziato's brother-in-law. So Tato's going to call for a sit-down. The Genovese people get in touch with Tato because of Alley Boy. We'll give you the lead. Whatever you come to an agreement with them, I'm in it. If you get... You want it, you're going to get, win them, sit down and kill this guy. I'll give Alley Boy permission to work with Sammy and Louie. Alley Boy is with us now in these conversations, and Tato's heading in. Danny Nunziato's a May guy. Tato's a captain. So Danny's going to come down with his captain. Who is his captain? Jimmy Rotunda. At that time, he wasn't the underboss, he was a captain. And he came down. Real nice guy. Great guy. Great reputation. Gentlemen, Tato and them talk. There isn't enough evidence for us to kill him. Their argument is he stood up. He's not a rat. He stood up. He went to trial. He didn't set him up. That's a lie. Maybe the kid who got uh, snatched did it. He's blaming, always blaming somebody else. Well, anyway, we lose the sit down. We lose the decision. Tyler agrees. He just went through hell. It's over. Let's end it. Stay away from this Larry Martiri. The answer is no. Goom, told my Goombat Alley boy, go back and talk to your people and tell them that's what I ruled for us. Alley Boy said, he, he, they already agree. Whatever your ruling is, they, they'll abide by it. So I'm not going to be on it either. And that's how I met Jimmy Rotunda. That's the whole story leading up to Jimmy Rotunda's death. But there's a little bit more. After that, that was in 74. In 76, I got made. I believe he was killed in 80. Eight, something like that. Uh, it, within that time frame, me and him became very friendly. As soon as he heard I got made, he sent for me and he became, he wasn't the captain no more, he was the underboss. 
call me. Congratulations, 76. These guys are good guys, bro. Stood up, you did the right thing. And then you did the right thing asking for this guy's life. But, you know, some things, you know, don't always go your way. And you took it like men. And I told him, that's why we're here. We respected the life. And then I got a little stronger and started playing with unions and construction and all of these things. And uh, he was very powerful with unions, the Longshoremen's Union. We had a good hunk of that. He had it in Jersey. And I became more and more powerful and more and more friendly with him. He had a concrete, he had a company that it was a concrete company in Coney Island. We, the, 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 the New York families, controlled the concrete companies. You weren't allowed in from Jersey. You weren't allowed in. This guy was in Coney Island with a small little bullshit company. We allowed it to stay there, but you can't grow. You can't become one of the big guys. He wanted to become a little bit bigger. And he said, Sammy, could you help me with the whole group? You have the families and everybody. You're very strong with Paul, with the concrete. I don't want to come become one of the big guys, my guy, but I would love for him to expand a little bit. And it's not really going to take anything off of anybody's plate. I liked him. And I said, Jimmy, let me think about it. Let me see what I could do. I had a meeting with people from the Lucchese family, the Colombo family. Colombo family I had pretty good relationships with. So I said, listen, he's a good guy. It's a small little company in Coney Island. It's, I think it's actually part of Bensonhurst book. I'll make him expand in... Benson Heights, Brooklyn. I'll make him expand in people want to do a concrete job, a sidewalk, a patio, small jobs. He won't bid big jobs. So it's really not taking nothing away from us. A little bit, maybe. And who it's taken away from the most is me because I'm in Benson Heights. So be, he'll be infringing on my turf a little bit. And I don't mind. I think we should be fair. I convinced him. If that's the way you feel, Sammy, and you're going to get hurt more than anybody else, it's not really hurt. You're going to lose a little bit of the pie. Crumbs. To me, I, I felt. So they agreed. Paul was aware, and Tyler was aware, of what I was doing in my conversations at, at all times. They always were. I never did things off the record or things on my own. I went back to Paul and told him, Paul, they agreed. This is what I could do. And I will make them expand a little bit. Small jobs. Ain't going to hurt nobody. You know, and uh, it'll be in our area, my area. It'll be a little less to me, a little less to you. That's great, Sammy. I love that negotiation, the way you did it and handled it. The guy is an underboss. Even though they're not under commission, the guy's an underboss. Great. Great. So I expanded him. So I had an ongoing relationship with him. After Paul was gone, John became the boss, and a lot of good things were done back and forth, and John appreciated that I have this real close, tight relationship with an underboss of another family. They became very close to us. Like I said, as soon as he was killed, he went right up John's behind, Riggy. He was like our little puppy. Good boy, nice boy. I don't want to belittle him, but that, that's what it is. That's what happened. So John was happy not only before he died that I had a connection with them, a strong connection, but that we would, if we needed help on the piers, we ran a good part of the piers. But in Jersey and some peers, they ran stuff out there. So it was a help to us. 
So he liked all of those connects. But now he was dead. So that's how I know Jimmy Rotunda. His son was a made guy. He made him. He was a made guy. After his father's death, I became a little friendly with him. Not too much, but a little bit. Because I was close with his dad. And he knew it. A while later, he became a captain. So that's how I know Jimmy Rotunda. His son was a made guy. He made him. He was a made guy. After his father's death, I became a little friendly with him. Not too much, but a little bit. Because I was close with his dad. And he knew it. A while later, he became a captain. A while after that, he flipped and cooperated with the government. and. Uh, he left the life, obviously. Him and this guy, Vinnie Green. The story becomes so complicated. Even the Weiss murder involves the DeCavacanti family and all stuff like that. I did videos on that, so I'm not going to go in, in all of those areas. But I was going to do this small story with Jimmy Rotunda. I was going to tighten it up a little bit. But... I thought it was interesting to tell the whole story. Now, I very rarely check myself, but I wanted to check. I did check. I, I looked at old newspapers and shit. I looked at it. And they're wrong. <laughs> so I'm glad I don't check because they're wrong. So Zaza's reading it to me, and I said, no, no, it didn't happen like that. She got a little frustrated. I got frustrated and said, listen, throw it away. I don't want to see it. They're wrong. Wikipedia and all these fucking things, they're wrong. I'm telling you what happened. But she laughed and said, Sammy, you, if, if I want to know something, I ask you. I don't have to read newspapers or anything else. She's a great kid. She's in the other room. Or I, I, I wouldn't call her a great kid because it'll go to her head. She's got looks and everything else. And now she's smart. Now she's being complimented. We'll make her like peanuts. We'll have two of them. So, uh, one more thing I think you'll love to know. When I went back to prison in, uh, in 2000, February of 2000, the ecstasy case, someday you'll hear stories about that. I was in jail. I was in prison again in 2000, February of 2000. And I did almost 18 years. Here's the craziest fucking thing in the world. Mail call. I get a letter. I had written, written a book already and everything. I get the letter and I open it up. I am so, so sorry for what I did to you. The way you talked about me in your book, it just breaks my heart that what I did to you was so fucking wrong. But I was so mad. It's fucking Michael Hardy. 20-something fucking years later, or whatever, 30 years later, whatever it was, 74, 74, I'm getting indicted to what, 2000? 84, 94, 26 fucking years later, he's apologizing to me. If you're listening to this, Mike, That letter, I was infuriated. But I was in prison. And I sat down with that letter and I had a chance to think. I accept your apology. And I'm not mad at you no more. You made mistakes. I did things, I made mistakes. I think everybody makes mistakes at one point in their life. I do respect that you sent me a fucking letter 26 years later apologizing. That's incredible. And I think it should be thrown into the story. And if you're listening to this video, Mike, I, I think the world of you, you're a tough guy. 
You did what you did. Don't send me no more letters. <laughs> I might get mad. Right now, I know I'm not mad at you. I'm really not. Okay, that's the end of the story. So, if you like it, press like. Subscribe always. Tonight, above all nights, I want to get home and watch Families of the Mafia. A couple of good episodes coming up. I don't think I'm in them. There's a Russian guy. There's this guy, Billy. I knew his father, Wild Bill. Me and him was like this. And if he's listening, I want to tell this story real quick. I'm going to add it on. This is how close I was with him. I went to a special breeder, and I got a, a dog, a puppy. I wanted a Rockwaller. My wife wanted a Rockwaller. And I got this puppy, specially bred. Beautiful. I get the dog, and I'm going to surprise my wife and take it home. And uh, I have an appointment with Billy, well, Bill. And I have the dog on a leash, little, little guy. And uh, he comes out. Oh, my God. Where did you get that dog? I got a friend of mine who's a breeder. Why? I, I, I'm i going crazy trying to get a dog. I, I love this dog. He's got the dog's face. He's playing. The dog's tail is going crazy. The little tail's going crazy. They fell in love right in front of me. Like He says, could I buy it? I, I says, I don't think he has any more. He sold them all. He'll get, you know, more. Oh, man. You like him that much? Yeah. I'm a sucker for shit like that. Take the dog. You kidding? No. I'll get another one sometime. Take the dog. Take them all. You told your kids, you this and that, the other thing. Now I know his son. He, he, he passed away a long time, but he was killed. He was gone a long time. And I know his son. He's actually on this show. He tells me the story. You gave it to him. Yeah, I did. I did. He said, you know how happy he was? Yeah, he must have been super happy. You know what he named the dog? No. It's Sam. <laughs> I thought it was a great story. All right. Adios.